Hello, you're watching the BBC News Channel with me, Sean Lay, at 12 minutes past one. Let's continue with the news that the Italian government has announced a massive lockdown affecting millions of people in the north of the country. Ski resorts, cinemas, gyms and nightclubs can't open in the region of Lombardy. Restaurants and cafes can, but customers must sit at least a metre apart from each other. In all around 16 million people across the north and east of the country are in quarantine as part of stringent new measures being introduced to tackle the spread of the virus known as COVID-19. All but emergency travel has been prohibited and that affects the entire region of Lombardy, including the country's financial capital, Milan. Or we talk now to Dr Claire Stanley, an assistant research professor at Georgetown University who specialises in how public response to infectious disease is handled. She's currently in Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, Dr Stanley, thank you very much for speaking to us on BBC News. Um, what are we seeing now in terms of the pattern of infection? Is it becoming clearer? You know, I think we are getting an incredible amount of data as countries share the information with the WHO and and um, and publicly as well. Um, so, you know, we are seeing that there is um, transmission can occur in communities now. We're seeing that in, in many countries around the world. Um, that's going to change how public health systems uh, respond. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that in the UK as well as, as other places. Um, the, the question, I suppose, is the, inevitably the length of this outbreak. It isn't something mm. we could possibly answer now. But looking at what's happened in China, we've now had a couple of days where the new number of new cases has, has not exceeded 100 a day. Mm -hmm. um, is that an encouraging sign or are, we, are, are, are scientists worried that maybe the, the virus is in abeyance but hasn't actually been killed off yet? Well, look, there are still new cases, so it definitely hasn't been killed off yet. Um, I think any decrease in new cases is an encouraging sign. China, of course, put in um, extremely stringent control measures um, starting already in January. And so we're hopefully seeing some of the impact of those measures. But look, we're into March now, so there is a time lag. We know there's a relatively long incubation period with this virus. And so I think it's a bit too early to tell whether we've really seen the back of it or whether cases will continue to dramatically increase. The difficulty, I suppose, for any um, government or local authorities planning the response when you don't know where uh, you're suddenly going to get a cluster of cases, you're suddenly going to get a significant number of cases that may have all kinds of knock-on effects. Some general measures are being taken. We've obviously seen in Italy the closure of schools as perhaps the most dramatic. Is that the sort of thing we should be expecting here eventually, that those kinds of big institutions are ones where people won't want to be actually mixing? Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things about this outbreak that's that's really been unprecedented is the amount of data that we're getting. This is, we have more scientific information about this virus in a short amount of time than ever before in history. So I really hope that public health authorities use that information when making their decisions. So, for example, we know the people who are at most at risk from severe impact of this virus, the elderly, those with comorbidities, underlying health conditions. Let's make sure we plan our public health responses to protect those people first and foremost. Um, one of the other questions is about resources. Um, I was talking to uh, a virologist from the University of Leeds a couple of hours ago, and he was saying uh, we have very good testing facilities here, but uh, the tests have to be evaluated. So you can do the testing, but then you have to wait for the results to come back. And that, that maybe is where there is a delay. And of course, that delay can then have an impact on knowing how quickly there are cases and how you respond to them. I mean, presumably this kind of practical question is, is, is a problem in lots of countries. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Although I think what we are seeing is that some of the countries that had the most impact from SARS back in 2003 mm -hmm. seem to be coping better, particularly with respect to the testing and management of contacts, uh, tracing the patients and, and seeing who they've come into contact with. Um, and so I think it just goes to show that experience and preparedness can really improve a country's response. Claire Stanley, Assistant Research Professor at Georgetown University. Thank you very much for talking to us this afternoon. Thanks for having me. Now, one of the people who will be affected by the Italian lockdown is Peggy Johnson. She's a British expat who currently lives in the village of Montevecchio in Lombardy. And she spoke to BBC Breakfast about her, how her daily life is changing. There's no social interaction. They don't want any big gatherings of people. All the sports facilities, you know, I can't go to the gym. That's closed down. The swimming pools are closed down. All the kids are at home from school, probably until the 3rd of April. Um, Restaurants and bars are allowed open if they can guarantee that the clients keep one metre from each other. And I, I don't see how that's going to work. How's the waiter going to serve?
now people are starting to take it more seriously, luckily, because I have, I have to defend Italy in this. Italy has been slandered as the worst place, the place that spread it all, all over the world. But Italy was the place that did more, most tests. So of course, they found more victims because they were doing the tests. And they put into place a lot of measures before any other European country. So I think they've handled it very well. You know, they, they really are trying, have tried their best to contain it. The supermarkets, even though there was a bit of panic buying at the beginning, the supermarkets are, are more or less, they're, they're pretty well stopped at the moment. There aren't many people in them. So just today, my local supermarket said that it will deliver groceries free of charge to anybody over 65. So that's good because people who you know, don't want to move, who can't move, at least they can get the groceries. Um, psychologically, <laughs> I've got lots of books to read, I've got lots of things to do on the computer. I'm getting used to the idea. I'm getting used to the idea because already I've been more cautious than most people because I have an underlying lung condition, so I'm a little bit more at risk. So I've been using my mask and washing my hands and not touching my face and all those things. I've not been out much over the last couple of weeks, I have to admit. So it'll just be an extension of that for me. That's her, one woman's experience of living under lockdown for coronavirus. Now, for a second consecutive day in China, as I was saying to Claire a little earlier, there have been fewer than 100 new cases of coronavirus across the country. The health authorities are reporting 44 new suspected cases in the past 24 hours. There have been a further 27 deaths, all of them concentrated in Hubei province, which is where the outbreak began.